Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here. It's my first presentation of the semester, but my third time in this class. And um, I love resumes. And you guys are very blessed because Dr. Monson cares so much about your resume quality. Hey, I know you. Um, that he has made it this big assignment, and he's invited me to start the semester. So I've been editing resumes for over eight years, probably edited over a thousand resumes, and and I think it's really fun. And hopefully you catch my enthusiasm and all the information that I'll share along the way. Um, and I'll be asking for readers and comments along the way, so it's not going to be just me lecturing. Hopefully you stay engaged. We will post a version of these slides on, on the Okay, so yes, I will send it to Dr. Watson. So that if there's something that goes by a little too quickly, don't panic. Yeah, you don't have to write down everything. Um, there are resources that you can refer to. Every speaker, but it will be true of this one. All right, so first, uh, question is, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. What do you think is the purpose of a resume? Or purposes? Yes? Uh, to portray your skills, qualifications, experiences to a potential employer and give like a brief summary of who you are. Perfect. Did you guys hear that? So basically a brief summary of yourself, your background, and your skills. What are you trying to achieve with a resume? What do you think? Yes? Get an interview. Yes, he was in my class before. Um, so that is, the, that is the goal. It's not to get a job. You can't get a job with a resume. You need a, a resume that gets you interviews, that gets you a job offer that you either accept or reject, right? So this is the first step to get you noticed. So I'm going to uh, show a bunch of stats about resumes and job searching in general. And I just want you to read them quietly to yourself and think, what does this mean for me as I'm writing my resume? Okay, what do you think? Because of this, I should therefore do what? Yeah. Awesome and what, is, what do you think that means? I just like, I guess like structure comes to mind, content, um, links of your resume, uh, Yeah, definitely. So we'll definitely cover all those things. What else? Okay. And also make the upper left corner really interesting. Yeah. What what usually shows up on the upper left hand corner? Anybody know? You want to shout out? Nobody's willing to take some risks. So usually education, usually your most recent job, and probably like your name, contact info. If you cut the top left corner, right? So that's where you want to keep the most uh, relevant information. Um, so formatting and content, those are the two major areas of having a good resume. And we're going to start with content, or sorry, format, and then talk a lot about content. And um, I want to point out the word polish that you, that you noticed. And that's what President, or <laughs> sorry, Dr. Monson <laughs> is uh, trying to help you do. Because what does polishing mean? It means applying friction over and over again, right? So if you bring copies back again and again, it's going to get just more and more polished. So think of it that way. All right, so formatting basics. Keep it to one page. You're all really young. You don't need more than a page until maybe like five to 10 years after college. Keep it to a reasonable size font. The, the main thing is like people can read it, right? You want to make sure that it's not too big that it's obnoxious and not too small, that it's like you have to squint to look at it, and that the font style is easy to read. I don't think that's a huge problem. I just wanted to make sure it's clear, though. And your margin should just be half an inch to an inch, not too big, not too small. And this is huge. Use bullets, not paragraphs, because a resume is meant to be scanned really quickly. It's not, it's not like a novel where you're where you're appreciating every single word, unless you make it through the many different uh, sifts. So first, a, an employer will pull up all the resumes that have come in for a certain opening and start sorting into yes, no, maybe. 
So yes, like they have all the qualifications and it looks like a fantastic resume. They'll say, okay, we'll, we'll probably interview these people. And then a no resume, either it looks sloppy and it's hard to read or they just don't have relevant experience and skills. And then a maybe like in between, right? So you wanna get into the S pile. Oops. And then you list all your experience in reverse chronological order. The reason for that is because you start with the most relevant and work your way down. I mean, everything on your resume should be relevant, but you start with the most relevant, and that is your most recent experience. Don't list references. That's old school practice. Uh, I don't see it too often, but I've seen it a few times still. You should have a list of references ready. Those are people that have seen your work and know the quality of your work and can speak positively about it. And you should ask their permission if you can put their name down as a reference, right? And uh, then they might be reached out to by the employer some, some point down the line. But you don't need that information on your resume. Just keep it somewhere else. OK, so the first thing on your resume is your contact info, right? Your name should be the biggest thing on the page because then the reader can notice right away who, who it belongs to. And then your contact info, your email and phone number are basically all you need. And your street address is no longer required because nobody mails you things anymore. Um, and it's kind of a way for employers to discriminate based on where you live, if it's too far, or in an undesirable neighborhood or something. That's just not information that's needed in this digital age. So don't waste space on that. But you should definitely have a LinkedIn URL, and that's a, a, that's a higher level that you should work on after you polish your resume, because then you copy and paste your bullet points onto your LinkedIn, and then you fill out all the other sections. And then you can uh, personalize the URL. The end part is usually just numbers and gibberish, but you can change that to some combination of your name, okay? Feel free to stop me at any point. I tend to go pretty fast. Okay, and then some people have this section after right underneath their contact info, and I really don't like it, but I'm going to show you how to do it correctly if you if you really want to. And well, you should for the one you turn into this class. Okay, so, so doctor. It, it might apply in some situations. But yeah. Not, don't turn one into me like that. Okay, Dr. Monson doesn't like me either. So can I have a reader to read these examples of what not to do? Thank you. <clears throat> Just let the yellow box? Yeah, the whole box that's crossed out. Okay. Objective to help people and find a job that will use my skills. Summary, hardworking team player looking for a full-time job after graduation. Thank you. So one of the key principles of effective communication is knowing your audience, knowing how to reach them in a way that would make them interested. So if you were to put yourself in your, the employer's shoes who might be reading your resume, what does this tell you about the person? Somebody shout something out. I'm okay with silence. Yes? I don't know. It sounds like a mutual bio or something, you know? Like, <laughs> it, it just seems a little bit unprofessional, I think. Okay, unprofessional. Why? Um, I feel like everybody would say that. Hardworking team player, looking for a full-time job, obviously everybody is. Exactly. So it's not unique and it's obvious, right? Which makes it really generic and completely unhelpful. So if you do want to write some kind of summary objective statement, it should be more like this. Can I have another reader? Oops, good job. Oh, I know. Right here? Okay. So what is, how is that better than the bad example? Yeah. Yes, so the more specific, the better. If it's not going to be specific, it's not going to be useful. And so you know, you don't need both, by the way. You probably just need one of these if you are going to have it on your resume. But you should have some summary of your skills. You should be specific about what you're aiming for and how your qualifications are going to be helpful to the specific employer. The right? reason I don't like these for this class is that none of you know what you're aiming for. <laughs> you're, you're not that far along yet. You have no idea what you want, so don't even try. This is not, we're not to that point yet. <laughs> right? 
Very good point. Unless you're applying for something super spe yeah. specific, like yeah. a scholarship or study abroad there or might be a something. Situation where one of you is like, this is you're graduating right now, and you have a very clear path in mind. And I'm not quite quite sure why you're in the class because we're going <laughs> to talk about a bunch of different stuff. But none of you know what you're doing. That's why you're here. So you, you shouldn't you shouldn't have an objective yet. And I don't want you just to make one up for the purposes of the. Of these yeah. Don't don't just do it just to do it. Help anyone. Okay, Dr. Watson is so real. It's gonna help you a lot. Okay, I should have done this at the beginning, but can you not, can I say a uh, raise of hands for freshmen in here? Okay, sophomores, juniors, seniors. Cool. We have a really even distribution. Okay, so the next section should be education, and you should not include high school information unless you're a freshman, because as soon as you get to college, you should be building your resume, gaining experience, gaining skills. But if you're a freshman, you know, you don't have much yet. So after that, you should only have your college information. So you should include both your degree and your major. Your degree is Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science, and your major, I'm guessing most of you are political science majors. Is political science a Bachelor of Arts or a Bachelor of Science degree? Arts, that's that. Don't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so don't just put a Bachelors of political science or degree in political science, be specific. And then the school name, BYU, spell it out, Provo, Utah. And then this, you should write this as just your graduation month and year. You don't need to put when you're starting. So put expected April 2023, whatever it is. And then these are other optional things you should include if you have that information. If your GPA is pretty high, you can include that. Or if the job description requires it. And then relevant coursework are classes you've taken that are specifically helpful to the job you're applying for. Um, so don't list all your coursework, right? It's just the ones that are specifically helpful. So if you, for example, if you're majoring in political science but you're wanting to work in tech somehow and combine those fields and you've taken coding classes, then you can put coding because people wouldn't expect that from a poli-sci major. And then study abroad classes if you have those memberships in clubs and associations, and then scholarships if they're really prestigious, like don't list all of yours, um, that would waste space. So here's what it could look like, and I encourage you to use different kinds of formatting, bold, italics, underlining, caps, capital letters, um, and use your space on the page in a balanced way. So use both the left and the right sides. Right? A lot of templates are like they look nice, but they don't give you enough space to put everything you need to. So I encourage most of you just to create your own templates. Or we have uh, general general templates that you can tailor from the Career Services website. Can I make two points? Yeah. One, please tailor their templates. Don't just adopt their template and don't think about how to tailor it. They'll have particular margins or fonts that may or may not work for you. You should use it as a, as a guide, as a model, but don't just put your information in and think that that's good enough. Two, and I'll show samples. Yeah, and, and here I like this, right? It, what I like is that they have the university and the place on the same line and the bachelor's degree and the date on the same line. You're gonna, the, the, this is when it happened and this is where it happened, okay? One of the templates that I saw students using from Career Services last semester had these two reversed. And I saw draft after draft after draft that had, had them backwards. So it would say, Brigham Young University expected April 2023 and Bachelor of Arts in American Studies, Provo, Utah. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And, and I was kind of amazed that nobody noticed to switch it. Another quick and easy trick in Word or Google Docs is if you want to make this look really pretty, create a table in the Word document and, and split it into four cells so that BYU is in one cell, Bachelor of Arts and Political Science is another, Provo Utah is in one, and expected in April 2023 is another. And then uh, when, you're, when you've got all the information in there, you can highlight the table, right click, go to borders and shading, and make all the lines invisible. And here's why that's a beautiful thing, because you can take this and right justify it so that, so that it all lines up on the right side evenly. And you can, oops, you Sorry. can simultaneously left justify this. 
on the same line. You can't left and right justify things on the same line unless they're in a table. And so I like to I like to use a little table so I can make it look pretty and efficiently use the space. So that's just one little thing that you could do. And that way, when you go down to experience and start listing jobs, follow the same exact format so that you have the employer and the position, right? The employer and where they are located and the position that you had and the dates that you had the job. And you can use a little table so that it all looks very coherent and similar from the education section to the experience section. Then it looks really pretty. And believe it or not, that pretty I, I haven't heard that advocated for so strongly. I've never used a table because it drives me nuts. So it's really up to you. Like if it's driving you crazy and you just want to throw away your computer, then don't don't use it, right? But if you are good at using tables and, and finessing that, then, then go ahead. Um, so going to the bullets, uh, these are the relevant coursework examples and then study abroad. So you don't want to give it too much space. And then experience bullets, this is the bulk of what we're going to talk about. So you want a bullet point for each skill set. You don't want to have redundant bullet points, like three bullet points talking about the same task that you did. And you also don't want to squeeze like five different uh, skill sets into one bullet. So we'll go through examples. And then you always want to start with an action verb. So what is a verb? Really basic question. It's an action, that's true. Uh, it's what you do, right? It's, it's not an adjective, it's not an adverb something that ends with L-Y, it's not a noun. So always start with a verb because resumes are focused on facts and action. And you wanna use the present perfect tense, I believe that's called. So you don't need the S after it, you don't need I-N-G after it. And eliminate all the A, an, and pronoun words because that just, uh, is superfluous, you don't need that. You can delete all those words, save space, and still have it mean the same thing. No acronyms, because you don't want to confuse anybody. So, I mean, especially if you're applying to government jobs, the person reviewing it might not know what all those things mean, even if the supervisor would. Be very specific and quantify with numbers. So if you remember nothing else, I think the, one, the things I'm gonna drum in the most are be specific and use numbers, right? Make sure that your bullet points are telling something that they don't know, that is unique about you, and give them a way to measure it. Give them some uh, context to understand what you did, and the numbers will do that. We'll go through lots of examples. Can I just say that in a different way? Yeah. Say it, what you're trying to do with these, with these bullet points under experience is to, uh, instead of claiming that you're awesome by just saying I'm really good at X or Y or Z, is you're, you're, you're providing evidence that allows them to infer how awesome you are. Exactly. Right, so you're, instead of saying I, I am really good at this, then instead of doing that, what you say is I did the following and I did it a lot of times and I got, and, and, and it allows somebody to say, oh, he did it so much, he must be good at it. Or mm -hmm. I got promoted. And that that's allows me to infer, oh, he must have been good if his last boss promoted him quickly. Or I trained, I trained other new employees. Oh, that helps me to understand that you were trusted by your employer to do training. And that means that you were probably competent in what you did. So you don't say, I was, I was a really good uh, uh, janitor. Uh, you say, I, was, I trained all of the other janitors on my shift and I was promoted to a shift leader after three months on the job. Oh, suddenly I know that you are a really good janitor and you are trusted. And now I don't care that you know how to clean toilets well. What I care about is that you have character traits and, and a work ethic that allowed your last employer to promote you. Oh, now I can see that that janitor job that you got promoted at and were the trainer and the shift coordinator or whatever for, uh, means that you're gonna be a good employee doing software testing or do it something completely unrelated, right? And, and it, so it's meant to communicate what character traits or skills or things that, that you have that are transferable to other things. And, and, and I think really working at that is the hardest part of this. It is, but if that's the art of resume writing. You'll get better with practice. And so another principle is show, not tell. 
telling is telling I'm, I'm good at this. I am an expert at this. I, uh, but when you, when you show, you just state the facts, right? You can't argue with the fact that you were promoted after three months on the job. But if you say, I was really successful and good at my job, what the, what the heck does that mean, right? So you just want to give um, facts that people can't argue with. They just, they just read it as fact. OK, so this is how you would format it, as Dr. Mons mentioned, something like this. So I, I recommend, well, OK, I don't want everybody's resumes to look exactly the same, and they won't because you have different experience. But I like to bold the organization names and put the location across from that, and italicize the job titles and then have the dates next to that. So that's, I think, the best way. But if you have some other circumstance, then it's OK. Like, this is flexible. Um, you should work with that. But make sure it makes sense that when somebody reads it who doesn't know you at all, it's clear, OK, where did you work, for how long, and what did you do? So you can see they all start with different verbs, action verbs, right? And make sure that pres present tense is, is present for, like, for the present uh, position you have, and that all your past positions are past tense. So when you end a job, don't, don't forget to make it past tense. And then there's lots of different ways to write numbers. You can write um, approximations using the little squiggly line that's called a tilde, I believe. And you can use ranges, because most of you will probably not know exactly the numbers from previous jobs. So you can say, I don't know, 30 to 40, right? Uh, or you can say at least 20. I know it was at least 20. I don't know how many, because it changes day to day. That's fine. You can have a minimum number. You can also have uh, percentages. Data-oriented people love percentages. Business people love percentages, because it helps them exact to see the exact quantity and proportions. Um, and then also it can show increase. So instead of saying improved customer relations, how can you measure that? I know sometimes it's hard to measure. But if you can find a way, like increased um, patron visits by 12%, right? And you have to find that out from your previous employer. So you might need to email them or call them or text them, depending on your relationship with them, and then ask, do you remember how many customers came in after I started working there? Do you remember how much it went up? You know, just try to get some stats if you can. And then the word to in a resume is kind of a magic word because it shows the purpose of what you did. So in the second bullet under the first job, organize three to four events per semester, most people would just stop there, right? Because it's like, well, that's what I did. But what did you do it for? Because that's something that you don't see readily. Like, uh, it could be to raise money. It could have been to build social interactions. It could have been to, um, I don't know, increase participation. But this person, it's to connect employers with students. So that shows the what purpose you did, um, what you aimed for in that job. Any questions with the formatting or basic nuts and bolts of this? OK, let's go through some examples. So you can organize it in different ways. Um, you can have just all your experience in the middle section just under experience. Or if you're applying to something specific and you have jobs that are not related at all, right? You're like, OK, well, I was a waitress for the past three years. But uh, before that, I was an intern at Google. And now I really want to apply to Apple. So you don't want them to see the waitress job first, because they'll be like, oh, what's this uh, applicant doing here? You, you can move your um, Google experience under relevant experience. So you, you can decide what they see first, because they're going to go from top to bottom. And then the section underneath that would be other experience, where you don't have to give as much detail. And you can just let them know, I have diversity of work experience, but I really want you to focus on this so thing. So you're just kind of accounting for your time, so that they know yeah. that you were gainfully employed and a useful person, even though you weren't doing something directly applicable. So. Right, and every single job you have that you ha have had is valuable in some way. Even if the content is not directly relevant, it shows that you can follow instructions. It shows that you made it through the interview process. It shows that you have been able to learn something new. It shows that you worked in a different environment. So don't leave off jobs just because they're not directly relevant. Just put them in the other section, like this. right? So it's like, OK. That's not as impressive, but look, I interned at Desert News, so I want them to see that first and give them more numbers and more details, and then just give them like one bullet for the other experience. 
right? We all have jobs like that that are kind of dead-end jobs that we do just to make money, and that's fine. Your students, people understand that. You can also categorize it um, using employment experience, which is, which is paid, and volunteer experience, which is not paid. And the only reason I would suggest using that kind of categorization is if you had some really impressive volunteer experience, something that you weren't paid for, but that you just did because you cared about the cause or that you, um, yeah, you really loved doing it. And you can give yourself credit for it. Write about it as if it was a job, right? I, I think Yeah. The volunteer experience. Definitely. But if it's the only thing that you have to list under volunteer experience, then it's a little bit of an orphan, and I would say just have it under every with everything else. Or other experience. experience. Or other experience. But if you have more than one vol significant volunteer experience to list, then listing the mission and some other thing that you did for a few months somewhere is is a good idea. That allows them to, to make an inference about you that you want to give of yourself to to good causes, and, and since you've done it more than once in a significant way, you must really believe in this. Yeah, and I encourage all of you to do volunteer work. I was an NSO leader for like seven semesters just because I loved it, but it also gave me tons of experience, right? And if you are not sure where to start, just go to YSERV in the Wilk. There's, that's the volunteer central where you can find something that'll match your interests. Okay, let's have four readers. Can I have a, the first reader right now? In the back, thank you. So these are examples of how to write a bullet point. Okay, so there's huge differences, right? So you can see right away, the best example has way more numbers and is way more specific. And if you're reading this as an employer, what kind of skills do you think this person has? from this bullet? On the poor one, I think they know how to set up chairs. Right, right, that's all you know, right? Like set up events, I think that means show up early and set up the chairs and tables. I put out the, I put out the, the plastic silverware. Yeah. And the second, the meh one is like, okay, well at least it's like social events for clubs, so it's a little bit more context. But the best one, what, what does it tell you about the, the person? Use your imagination. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they connect with people, right? Because you have to work with a ton of people to plan an event. Did you have something else? I was just going to say they have some impressive communication skills. Yeah, yeah. And so do they mention anything about communication skills? No. But they, they don't need to, right? Because you, you can understand that in order to work with this many clubs and people, you have to communicate with people, and you have to do it efficiently. So I would, in my mind, I would do the math over how many semesters was this. So I would look up at the, at the line where it said, how long they held this job, and I say, oh, it looks like about four semesters. Oh, wow, this person has done this a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so They must be really good at it by now. They must be really experienced at this. And they don't claim that they're really experienced other than showing the evidence that they've done it a lot, right? Right, so one way to measure using numbers is how often you do something. So per week, per semester, per month, per year, per quarter, per day, however you measure things on in that role, then use that measurement. Okay, second reader. Or I'll just start calling on people. You guys are a little too respectful. Okay, you're right there. Thanks. Four, ran cash register, met, managed cash transactions, best ensured accurate financial transaction of 3,000 to 5,000 while providing quality service to 75 plus customers per shift. Okay, thank you. So you can estimate, right? Because you're not going to know exactly how much money you managed. And that's totally fine. It's just to give a ballpark range so people can understand what you dealt with. Um, any thoughts or comments about what this person possesses in terms of skills that are transferable? Mm -hmm. Customer service jobs are hard because you don't know who you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They cared, right? You can tell that they cared by which word, would you say? Quality service. Quality service. That means they wanted it to be a really good experience for the people who came into the stores. And who wouldn't want to hire someone like that, right? What about the first part? What kind of skills come with that? 
Yeah. I think it's, I mean, it gets across a big meaning, I think, to say that they ensured accurate financial transactions of such large amounts. Mm -hmm. Because an employer is not going to want someone who they don't know how much money they accurately um, managed, and um, especially if it's low. Right, right. Like a bank or something like that. So Definitely. Mm -hmm. If this were, if this bullet were paired with one that said you were the employee of the month three times or you were promoted to manager after six months, then I would find the claim of quality service and accurate financial transactions even more credible. So in some ways, the bullet points can, can play off of each Definitely, other. Definitely, yeah. Add These are just single examples. So that, so that you say that you, 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 you give some evidence that you were made the, you were, you know, deemed the employee of the month and in a company of uh, 600 employees three times over three years. That's amazing, right? You must have been really good at this or, or you got promoted. Now I really believe that you provided quality service. That, that little claim that you're, that's a little bit unsupported here, right? Has support from- Another bullet. Another bullet point. So think about how they interplay with each other and, and, and think about that you can <laughs> offer evidence for one bullet point in another bullet point or that sort of shores up the claim that you're making here. Yeah. So if you, if you are like me, you might be discouraged at this point and think, I was never employee of the month <laughs> or I didn't win any awards on the job. And that's okay because now you're more aware of how you should be writing your bullet, your bullet points and going forward in your classes and your volunteer work and your jobs and your internships, anything you do that goes on your resume, you want to do your very best because you want to be able to be honest when you say, I was really good at this, right? And you don't make up any numbers, you don't feel insecure when they ask you about it. Just try to give your best so that when you write about it, you can write, in, write it in a really good light. By the way, if you were an employee of the month repeatedly in a company of three, uh, that may not be something you wanna put. Why? Because you'll get the interview and they'll say, oh, I see that you were employee of the month six months out of the year. How big was the company? And, they, and, you, and then you have to sort of admit, well, it was only three of us. And, now, and it'd be now, harder to defend. Now you look kind of foolish, right? You know, it looked really good on paper at the time. You thought it was a good idea, but then you... So think about, okay, what are they going to ask me about this bullet point? And, uh, and you can think, am I over-claiming or am I sort of making something that sounds foolish? When, when you start answering questions about it, does it feel a little bit like you're stretching? And if so, then, then dial it back to something that you're really comfortable talking about in more detail. Because when there's something impressive, Somebody's going to ask you about it, and you need to be ready to say That's in true. more detail that now comes across as, as adding the, the uh, things that make it sound even better and, and, and sort of satisfies the curiosity in a way that they come away, the, the, employer, the prospective employer says, oh, that is really impressive. Uh, it's really nice that you, that you shared that additional detail that when I asked, because now I'm thinking, oh, I, this, is, this was, uh, I, I, I made the right decision to bring this person. Yeah, so thinking ahead, uh, you can just be ready to talk about it because your goal is to get an interview, right? And you, you'll have time. It won't be like tomorrow coming for an interview, but just be ready to talk about what's and on your resume. I say that having talked with dozens of students about their resumes, and I will start asking you questions about these bullet points, partly because some of them are pretty weak and I want to help you to elicit information that you can write. And sometimes you're claiming something that I think, that sounds ridiculous. And so I'll start asking questions to, to help you understand as you sort of reveal to me what it really was. And you'll say, oh, when I talk about it, that sounds ridiculous. And I'll say, yeah, it does sound ridiculous. You should dial that back a little bit. So just think about how what you're going to get asked about and whether when you answer that question, it's going to come off as you sort of stretching the truth beyond a reasonable level of sort of uh, polishing your Yes, all really good points. Okay, so I had a couple more examples, but I feel like you probably get it, right? Do you guys understand the concept of be specific, use numbers, show, don't tell? Um, so I'm gonna move on because I have some other things to show you before we wrap up. So if you, a lot of you have served missions, raise your hand if you have. Cool, so you're probably wondering how the heck do I write about that? And we have a whole worksheet on the Career Services website, or you can come into the office and get the worksheet, but just some examples. Uh, you, I recommend writing full-time representative or full-time volunteer and avoiding the word missionary because the word missionary can mean means different things to different people. So you don't want to 
confuse people. And then write about it just like it was a job, because it pretty much was a job. You had duties to do, you reported to a supervisor, right? And you put in a lot of hours. So write about the things that are relevant to whatever job you're applying to. Like, do they care about my leadership skills? Okay, let me give examples of that. Do they care about um, me managing um, money if you worked uh, on the budget uh, on the mission? Or if you did service, like what kind of service? What was your impact? Um, you can write about all of that. Or teaching skills, a lot of teaching skills on the mission and working with people from different cultures, right? Just be specific. And uh, if it's under the volunteer section, put full-time representative so it's not redundant. If it's not under the volunteer section, put full-time volunteer. Any questions about that? I would, I would simply add that one sort of easy thing for, for you to do for if, if you didn't work in the office and do all the financial transactions or if you weren't the assistant to the president or something and, and, and you don't have some of the training to, one, emphasize language skills if, if they existed in a way that, that makes it clear that you got fluent. So, so adding that you taught, uh, taught in Hmong, taught a lot of, contacted and worked with people in their native tongue and you, you achieve fluency, this is a good place to do that. And another thing to do is just to emphasize that you worked really hard. And the way to do that is to use numbers. Most missionaries work 10 to 12 hour days, six days a week. So if you're a, you're, if you're a full time representative for 18 months or two years and you, and you basically say I worked 12 hour days, six days a week, that's like, oh, you are not around when you said full-time volunteer. That's like, and, and, then, and then they ask you about it and you say, yeah, we left the house at 9 a.m. every day and we got home about 9 p.m. and we were out visiting people and doing teaching and classes and, do, you know, all day long out and about and they're like, oh, yeah, all right, that's a real, real experience that you had or something like that. And then, and then you get the idea that, man, you know how to work hard. Yes, that's the point. That's what I was trying to communicate with this. Thing. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna just breeze through the rest because it's not relevant to a lot of people, but if you have research experience, write about it as if it was job. And be really specific about what the question was, what the hypothesis was that you're researching, and your title is research assistant. You don't need to write anything about the professor's name because, unless they're world famous or something. And then your employer is BYU department of whatever department, okay? So not the professor, but the department and then skills and awards, if you have any awards, um, then you could probably combine it together and only put hard skills. So that's what we've been talking about the whole time. Hard skills are things you can measure that, you can, that are easily teachable. So any kind of tech, any kind of language skills are hard skills. The, all the other stuff, like hardworking, creative, leadership, communication, things that are hard to put your finger on and hard to prove by writing um, are soft skills. So you don't need to write in sentences. You can just put what they are. And I prefer this way, having bullet points um, and bolding the category of skill, and then a colon, and then just list what they are. For languages, you want to put your level of proficiency um, so they don't think that you're fluent if you're not. Or they don't think that you're a beginner if you are fluent. And then publications and presentations, you can just look at when we post the slides, because I want to show you just some final examples. So know your audience, proofread, 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 because I still find typos in my resume, like now, after looking at it so, so many times. And tailor to the job by using the language of the job description, like read the job description and see if there's any phrases in your resume that you could replace with what's used in the job description. And then moving uh, jobs around between the relevant and other sections, depending on what the job is you're applying for. Be consistent in formatting and everything. When you add a new job, make sure it looks like the other jobs in the spacing, the dash lengths, even the bolding. And then make sure you only, um, so if you're gonna use periods, use them in all bullets. If you don't, then take them out of all bullets, right? Just be consistent. And like, talk about past tense and present tense. And always send us a PDF because that maintains the formatting, right? You don't know what that computer is gonna do when somebody else opens it. So. Every time I didn't get a PDF last semester, just so you know, which was more than I wish. Okay, I'm just going to show you a couple more of the examples. So here's one. So 
So this person had a lot more in the education section, as you can see, and they worked for several BYU offices, so they just put uh, BYU, the acronym, up here so they don't have to write out the full name down here. And they just have one section, just volunteer, or sorry, just experience. They didn't divide it into two sections. And then they have some other unique things to add as well. Here's another one. She has lots of great numbers. If you transfer from another university, you can put that there as well. And then her skills. Okay, we're out of time. Are there any final questions that you're just burning? in your mind. Okay, well you got a lot to work on um, and I would love your feedback as you're on your way out. If you could just hold up your phone cameras to this uh, code, it'll take you to a two-minute survey. Help me become a better presenter. Thank you for your time and attention.